Hello, I'm Chris Light. Welcome to Teachable Moments. Today we're going to be walking on the beach at the beautiful Gulf Islands National Seashore in the Panhandle of Florida. You're going to get to see some very interesting creatures. Uh, some of these were actually photographed at other beaches when I've traveled at different parts of the state. So I hope you enjoy our walk on the beach. I'm on Navarre Beach. This is actually part of the uh, National Seashore, Gulf Islands National Seashore here. We've got a beautiful day to be here. The water is very, very calm. Uh, a lot of people are swimming. Don't have to worry. They've got the green flags flying, which is a good sign. That means that the beach is safe to swim. Not much surf. They call this the Emerald Coast. Uh, I think it ought to be called the Aquamarine Coast because it's more bluish green than green. But the water here is just a gorgeous color. The sand is pure white. It looks like sugar. If we look at this grains, the individual grains, you can tell that they're quartz or white quartz. And originally they came from the Appalachian Mountains up around where I'm from in East Tennessee. See this dark sand? This is not dirty sand. These are just minerals that are heavier than the white ones, and so they can sort of settle out sometimes. Tropical Storm Cristobal came through here a couple of weeks ago, and you can see how far up we're up here by the picnic shelters, which are probably about 100 yards from the beach, and you can see how far up the water came during that storm. This is one reason that these dunes are so important to help to protect uh, what's behind them, the beach. These are the dunes. Sand dunes are very, very important to help to protect the beach. They've got these roped off to protect these dune plants after major hurricanes they have to come back in here and redo the dunes and put these um, sea oats back in to help the, the to hold the or the roots will help to hold the uh, sand together these are actually protected by law so they're not supposed to be dug or picked As a kid, my family used to go down and spend a week on a houseboat in a brackish water bay not too far from Navarre Beach. We would often take one day to go to the beach, and it was usually in June, and we would often have to contend with this nasty, green, slimy seaweed. It would uh, find its way into your bathing suit in places that you really didn't want it to go. <laughs> Seaweed is not a plant, it's in the kingdom Protista. This particular type is called Cladophora. The locals like to call it June grass because it starts to form in the summer, usually June through about July or early August. It's been found that this is a very important organism. It provides food for many animals. I'm gonna have some pictures of some other organisms that I found living in this that are pretty exciting. This seaweed is harmless, but it can be pretty gross when it washes up in huge amounts. I happened to be there at low tide, and so there was a, a lot of this built up on the beach. This is a type of seaweed called sargassum weed. It has little floats on it. You can also see a little bit of the green seaweed mixed in with it. On the blades are some little white organisms. These are the skeletons of some bryozoans. It's called sargassum sea mat. Sargassum weed is very important for lots of small animals. It's often possible to find 
small crabs, even some little fish will live in this. It can float as far away as the Sargassum Sea. Some of the uh, sea life finds wild places to live. Here we've got these little barnacles that are on a torn up beer can. It's a shame that people throw their trash into the ocean. It doesn't all stay in the water. Some of it washes back up on the beach. But things like plastics especially are really, really bad because they will deteriorate and break down. Um, we may be eating some of that in our seafood. Brown pelican is one of the largest and most animated birds that you might see at the beach. It's always fun to watch them fly in flocks. Pelicans are famous for their large expandable pouch. They catch fish and water in this pouch. They let the water seep out the sides before swallowing the fish. They do not carry the fish in that pouch. I'm always amazed to watch how pelicans can fly just inches above the water without getting caught in the waves. I've never seen one end up in the drink. It would be very easy to confuse the snowy egret with the great egret. The easiest way to tell the difference is that the snowy egret is much smaller, it's a little under two feet tall, and the great egret is about three feet tall. Another easy way to tell is to look at their feet. The snowy egret has yellow feet that almost looks like it's been walking in paint. You often see these birds along the shoreline catching small fish in the surf. Back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, these birds were nearly driven to extinction because of the beautiful plumage that they have when they're in the breeding season. Women like to have these plumes in their hats. A lot of these birds were killed for that to, to get those feathers. The Audubon Society was started because of these birds and their attempt to stop the hunting. I was surprised recently to find out that there's no such thing as a seagull. <laughs> there's different kinds of gulls. This particular one I'm showing right now is called a laughing gull. And you'll notice that during the Winter time, it has a white head. The plumage is much different than it is during the breeding season. During the breeding season, it has a black head. They're called laughing gulls because of the sound that they make when they give their call. The next little bird I'm gonna talk about is called the least tern. They're one of the smallest terns in that area. There are six different species of terns living in Florida. I'm going to talk about two of them. This one nests on the ground. They lay their eggs directly in the sand. It's fun to watch them as they hunt for their food. They fly over the water, they'll hover in the air, and then dive down into the water to catch the fish. Once they catch the fish, they take it back to their young. I'm watching a turtle. I can't tell if I've got it on video or not. They hover over the water. And when they see a fish, they dive down and catch it. Our next turn is called a sandwich turn. No, you don't put it in between a couple of pieces of bread and eat it. It was named for the Earl of Sandwich, who did come up with that form of eating. But this one is an easy one to tell it from the least turn. It's much larger. The black on its head doesn't go all the way to the beak. And the beak has a little patch of mustard yellow on the end of it. So it's an easy one to identify. The next five birds that I'm going to talk about are shorebirds. Most of these really don't like to get their feet wet. They will run back and forth along the surf 
and try to stay out of the water. They are looking for small worms, crabs, coquina shells, and those type of animals in the sand. This one is a black-bellied plover. Like some people, there are a lot of birds are true snowbirds. They come down to Florida during the winter time. The black-bellied plover is one of these birds. This one was taken in December at St. George Island, and it was just there for the winter. I enjoy watching the ruddy turnstones as they run along the beach and peck in the sand. If there were rocks on this beach, they would actually flip them over and try to find food under those rocks. I'm going to see how close I can get to these little birds. Uh, I believe they're ruddy turnstones. You can see them pecking in the sand. They don't get in the water. It's amazing how they can run away from the water so quickly. Uh, but they are looking for small animals that live in the sand. A lot of beach houses and streets along beach communities are named for this little bird. This is called a sanderling. I love to watch them as they try to catch their food. They run back and forth in the surf to get away from the water. The sandpiper is another very common shore bird. They're another one that will run back and forth to keep their feet out of the water. This precious little bird is called a snowy plover. They're one of the smaller plovers. They are on the threatened list. So it's a good idea to not take dogs on the beach because a lot of times dogs will chase and sometimes even kill these little birds. As we drove over the Navarre bridge to go over to Santa Rosa Island, we noticed signs showing people to stay back away from the nesting skimmers. These are very comical birds, both in the way they look and the way they sound. They're very noisy, squabbling with each other all the time. We did not see any chicks with these birds, so it may be a while. They may have already uh, fledged. We're down in Navarre Beach right now, and uh, we're on the causeway. They've got this roped off. You can see these little flags. These birds are called skimmers, and they're really interesting birds. The lower beak is longer than the upper beak, and I wish we could see one flying over the water. There's one, but I don't know if we'll see it or not. They run that longer beak along the surface of the water, and if there's uh, a fish that they can catch, they'll s snap onto it and then they can eat it. Um, it doesn't look like these are sitting on any eggs. I think they're just resting right now. Certain times of the year, they block this off so that it can be uh, safe for the, the babies. White ibis are comical birds. They've got a long red beak long red legs and a pale blue eye. They are wading birds. They like to try to catch fish and worms on the edge of the shore. Willets are one of the larger wading birds. You can see they don't mind getting their feet wet. So we've seen some of the common birds that live on the beach. Now we're going to move on to some of our more crabby inhabitants. Blue crabs are very common in the Gulf and in the, on the Atlantic coast. They make very good eating. One of the ways that people catch them is by using chicken necks on a string, and the crabs will grab it with their pinchers and start to eat. The males, as, as in the case of this one right here, are called jimmies. Female blue crabs are a little bit smaller than the males. I like to say that they wear fingernail polish. They've got the red tips on the ends of their claws. 
Female blue crabs have different names depending on the maturity of them. A sook is a mature female that is ready to mate. A sally is an immature female. And a sponge crab is a female with eggs and she can carry up to two million eggs. Despite that large number of eggs, on average only two of those eggs will be able to hatch and grow into mature crabs. A lot of them get eaten by fish and by other animals. Hermit crabs have to find a different shell to live in. They will often find shells of snails or conchs, something like that. As they grow and get larger, they have to get a larger shell. Some hermit crabs live in the water, others live on land. Many crabs that live in the water that swim have both swimming legs and walking legs. Some land crabs will roll little balls of sand around near their mouth and they're able to extract bits of food from that sand, leaving these tiny balls of sand behind. A lot of activity happens here at night. This is a little ghost crab hole and they stay down there most of the time during the day and then in the evening they come out and they scavenge for any uh, dead fish or whatever they can find on the beach. It's fun to watch these little crabs come out of their holes at night, go out on the beach and scavenge. They also will eat coquina clams and mole crabs. As you can see in this picture, they have two different types of claws. They have a crushing claw and a tearing claw. The crushing claw is used for breaking shells and the tearing claw is used for pulling the meat out. They have a very nasty pinch, so even though they look cute, do not catch them because they can really hurt. At certain times of the year, it's common to find horseshoe crab shells that have been molted up on the beach. These animals are not really a true crab. They're more closely related to spiders. They're very, very ancient animals. One of the things scientists like to do with them is to study their blood. They have blue blood instead of red blood. If you ever find a live horseshoe crab, you can pick it up. They're, very, they're harmless. Sometimes at low tide, you will find these little brown things that look sort of like chocolate sprinkles. Don't put them on your ice cream. They're actually the droppings of a ghost shrimp. Portuguese man of war is one of the critters that you do not want to meet up with in the water. After a spring storm, we saw a lot of these washed up on the beach. The Portuguese man of war floats on top of the water and the tentacles hang down underneath. They can be as long as six feet. They contain stingers that will sting fish and even people if they bump into them. Sea nettle jellyfish can give you a nasty surprise if you bump into one when you're swimming. They're almost impossible to see because they're transparent. It's very painful. It almost feels like a burn if you get one on you. Like its relative, the Portuguese man of war, the by the wind sailor also floats on top of the water. But unlike the Portuguese man of war, it is not dangerous. They're, they do not have stingers. These were washed up on the beach by the hundreds. They have the little sail that the wind can push them along. Often they will get washed up on the beach. Moon jellies also wash up on the beach fairly often. They have a very mild sting. This one is a male, so pink in this case is for males. Wow, I have absolutely hit the mother load of cool stuff here. This is the sargasso weed that I pulled out of the surf, so it's a little bit um, fresher. This is really, really exciting. It's kind of weird looking, but this is called a sea squirt. And I'll try to post a little bit more information about it later. I glanced over and saw something really exciting. 
This is a, a skate egg case. And skates are, they're related to stingrays and sharks. So this is the egg case. If I was to open that up, there would probably be a um, baby one in it. They use those little curly cue things on the ends to hang on to um, seaweeds and things like that on the bottom of the ocean. But sometimes they will get dislodged and they'll wash up on the beach. Well, if I thought one skate egg case was exciting, six is absolutely incredible. These are all tangled up together. They've got these little, it's like it's a little thread that they're attached to. I have never seen this before. Um, unfortunately, well, I think they're empty. So that's good luck. That's good news. At least the babies have come out. Like I said, you never know what you're going to find on the beach. This is called a sea cucumber, and I just happened to find it washed up on the beach. Uh, I may try to kick it back in. We're at low tide right now, so they, um, a lot of things are washing up. Here you can see the mouth. I didn't expect to find so many cool things today, but uh, this, this is quite a find. I'm really excited about this. Sea cucumbers are leathery. They don't look anything like their close relatives, the sea stars, sea urchins, and sand dollars, but they do have little spikes underneath their skin. They have tentacles that come out of the mouth area, and that's what they use to gather their food, which is usually plankton. One of the ways that they can avoid their enemies is pretty weird. They can shoot out their internal organs, which will entangle and distract the predators, and it might even give the predators a meal. Sooner or later, they will grow those internal organs back. is still alive. It was moving a minute ago. I think the tide may be coming back in now. It looks like the water's getting a little bit higher. What is that? It's called a uh, sea cucumber. Oh my Isn't it weird? Most people refer to these animals as starfish, but they're actually called sea stars. As you can see, they don't always have five arms. This one has nine. The two shorter ones are probably regenerating. It probably lost pieces of it at being eaten by an animal or something, and they can grow these back. I'm glad we don't have to eat the same way that sea stars do. They use these little sucker feet to pry open shells, and then they invert their stomach out of their mouth down into the shell of the animal and digest it inside the shell. Yuck! The sea urchin is related to the sea star and the sea cucumber that we just saw. This one is one of the safe ones. You could pick this one up and it wouldn't hurt you. I've been snorkeling in the Caribbean and come across the black spine sea urchins. Those can be dangerous. The spines can break off in you and cause serious infections and pain. Sea urchins creep along the seafloor looking for food. One of the things that likes to eat is sponge and they also eat algae. The little white structure that you see in the middle of this sea urchin is the mouth. It's got five beak-like teeth that it uses to graze on sponges and algae that it finds on the sea floor. Most people would call this a sand dollar, but a true sand dollar does not have holes in it like this does. This is the five-hole keyhole urchin. A little girl had found this when it was only about maybe two inches across, if that big. Usually 
the ones that you find on the beach are in pieces. When keyhole urchins are alive, they're covered with a brown fuzz. On the underneath side, that's their feet, and they can crawl through the sand looking for food. Don't ever take live sand dollars out of the water to take home. They're going to smell really bad after a few hours, and they're, often you'll find stacks of them that people have decided they would take home and found out they stink. So it's better just to leave them in the water and let them live their life out. This orange organism is a sponge. Well, sometimes sponges do wash up on the beach. Not everything's so exciting, such as this nasty glove and some old goggles. Right now, I'm walking on a sandbar. You can tell how deep the water is just by the color. Certain times of the year or after storms, you have to be very careful with rip tides. This is when the water comes in and then it, it goes back out. And if you get caught in one, it can pull you out to, uh, to see. You can always get out of them if you swim parallel to the beach. This odd fish is called a remora or a shark sucker. They have this flat part on top of their head that they use to attach to either sharks or turtles, sometimes whales, and they will follow the, these animals so that they can find food. They will eat little bits of food that the other animals don't get. We found this remora up on the here at Navarre Beach. Unfortunately, these fish are often treated as trash fish and just left to die when they are pulled up. I hate to see a wanton waste of animals like this. Remoras do not have teeth, if you notice in this picture. They also have this odd plate at the top of their head. This is what they use to hang on to turtles and sharks and whales know what we're going to see when we go out on the pier and we always are thrilled when we get to see the green sea turtle. Sea turtles are reptiles so they have to come to the surface to breathe. They also have to come to land to lay their eggs. It's often possible to find sea turtle nesting areas marked off on the beach. Another really exciting animal to see is the dolphin. We often see these when we go up on the pier. The last time we were down there, we noticed that the dolphins were swimming much closer to land than normal. And the fishermen said, we've been noticing sharks around here. Dolphins are mammals, and so they have to come to the surface to breathe. Their blowhole is the hole that you see up there at the top. They don't squirt water out of it like you see in cartoons, <laughs> but what they do is they will blow the air out, they exhale, and sometimes water is blown off. There are two basic types of seashells that you'll find on the beach. One are the gastropods. Gastropod means stomach-footed. These are always one shell, and usually it's a snail or a conch or a whelk. The shark's eye is a predatory snail. It has a sharp radula that's able to drill through clam shells and bivalve shells and eat the animal out of them. When you find bivalve shells like these with holes in them, that's a sign that a gastropod has drilled holes in them and eaten out the animal. The shell with the long groove in it on the right was attacked by a polychaete worm which would have eaten the animal inside that shell. One of the advantages of getting up before sunrise is to see these creatures such as this Florida fighting conch out on the beach hunting for food. 
this is a funny picture because you can see the eyes and the tube-like mouth that it uses for feeding. Many of the marine snails are able to seal themselves inside their shell using this hard flat plate called the operculum. The operculum can also be used to help the animal move along the sand. To the untrained eye, a lot of these seashells look the same. One of the things that will differentiate the lightning whelk from a lot of the other shells is that the opening is faced to the left instead of the right. The species named Sinistrum refers to the left-handed opening of this shell. I photographed this banded tulip snail at a nature center in a touch tank. You can see the operculum, the foot, and the head where the two eyes are. The olive shells are the speed demons of the gastropods. They can really move fast. One of the things that they eat are the coquina shells and they're able to bury into the sand to catch their prey. I don't know how in the world I got so lucky today, but this critter right here is called a sea hare. It's still alive. Um, the reason they call it a sea hare is you can see the head on it. Or the tentacles kind of look like rabbit ears. So you may be wondering, if this is a gastropod, why doesn't it have a shell? Not all gastropods have external shells. Some of them have internal shells. This is also related to squid and octopus. It's interesting to know that if this animal is bothered by a predator, it can give off ink, just like an octopus or a squid does. Where gastropods have a single shell, bivalves have two shells. Most of the shells you see in this photograph are coquinas. Coquinas are the little shells that get uncovered by a passing wave. They will quickly dig back into the sand with their muscular foot. You often see sandpipers, sanderlings, ruddy turnstones, and even ghost crabs will eat these little animals. Most bivalve shells are found singly on the beach. Every now and then you get lucky and you'll find the matching pair. It's very unusual for this to happen because they get separated after they die. Calico scallops are beautiful little shells. They come in lots of colors and patterns. The living scallop has a row of tiny blue eyes that it's able to see predators. It also can clap the two shells together and move by jet propulsion. I'm kind of struck out today on seashells. This is not the only time of year. They're better in the winter time. Uh, but I wanted to show this black one. This is one of the scallop shells. And what happens is that when they get buried in the sand for a long time, they start to take up the minerals in the sand and they will turn black. This is why when you find shark's teeth, the fossilized shark's teeth uh, on the beach, they are black. Some seashells have some really cute names, and the kitten paw is one of them. This shell is actually related to the scallop. The imperial venus clam has a very, very thick shell. This is probably to help keep it from being eaten by snails. There are lots of different clams, including the calico clam and the bittersweet clam. Very pretty shells. It's fun to see how some people use their imagination with shells and seaweed. These are some great big cumulus clouds. They could later on turn into cumulonimbus clouds. This time of the year, when you've got warm, moist air rising, it condenses when it gets into the higher elevation and they can turn into thunderstorms. A few years ago, my husband and I were going to go to the beach, and he said, I hope we get to see a thunderstorm at sea today. Well, he certainly got his wish. <laughs> when we got there, we looked out, and we saw this big, dark cloud. This is what they call a squall line. It was full of lightning, 
full of very heavy rain and extremely strong wind. The wind blew so hard when it finally reached us that it blew sand up into the motor block of the car. So he got a whole lot more than what he bargained for. After a storm, the surf often looks like a sudsy bubble bath. Sea foam is made from the pulverized microscopic organisms such as diatoms and other plankton when their fat is whipped up into a froth of suds. Sea foam is harmless unless it forms during a red tide event when toxins from the red algae are released into the air and can cause severe irritation to people's nose and throat. Many beaches will have these flags to warn people of dangers. If there's two red flags, that means that the beach is closed. One red flag is, will be open, but it's not a good idea to swim because the surf or currents can be very strong and dangerous. Green flags are a great thing to find because that means that the water is safe and it's going to be a good day at the beach. Purple flags are indicative of dangerous marine life, so that means that there could be stinging organisms such as sea nettles or Portuguese men of war, or there could be sharks. So not a good day for going to the beach. Well, I think my walk on the beach is just about over. I'm getting hungry, and my husband, who doesn't like to get sunburned, is up under the shelter, so I need to go find him. It looks like uh, the population is starting to pick up here. There weren't this many people when we got here earlier. But it's not as crowded as it would have been if we had gone to Navarre. This is the end of our walk on the beach. I hope you've enjoyed it. I surely have. Uh, we found some really exciting things. And I hope maybe to get back down here in the winter and we'll take another walk. So enjoy the National Seashore.